Good evening, Mr. Bond fans, and welcome once again, where, as promised, we are looking back at the original Never Say Never Again uh, video that was uploaded on this channel in, like, 2010, 2011, something like that. Why Never Say Never Again? Well, The Spy Who Loved Me was the previous uh, video that I looked back at, and then before that it was GoldenEye, which were two incredibly positive reviews, and I kind of wanted to mix it up by going to something that I know I won't have been very kind to at the time. Uh, probably because I'm not very kind to it now, but Never Say Never Again is a film that I've never particularly enjoyed. Um, and I'm curious as to when I even first saw it. I feel like it was one that was kind of had this other status for so long. I remember seeing when I saw the 60s Casino Royale for the first time. Never Say Never Again, I don't. So I'm going to be curious to hear if I have any memories of that from... 10, 11, 12 years ago. I expect there's going to be a lot in the way of... Kevin McClory sniping. So let, let, let's see whether I'm lucky that his lawyers never came after me when he was alive. Oh, hello and welcome again to another edition of my weekly bond. You know, I'm just going to come out and say it. I am not, nor have I ever been the biggest Connery fan. I think he's alright as Bond and I think he's absolutely great in Dr. No from Russia with Love and Goldfinger, but... I would always take Roger Moore, Pierce Brosnan, and Daniel Craig over him any day, so the prospect of Connery returning uh, many years after he said he was never going to play Bond again uh, for an unofficial Bond film is not something that necessarily fills me with joy. How was I not run out of Bond fan community town for that? This is quite, uh, you know... Yeah, just laying it all out on the line. Funny, because now I think I would probably... I, I, Roger and Pierce are still my favourites. Um, I'd, I'd take Connery over Craig now, which is interesting. God, because, yeah, even back then, actually, there, there was only Casino Royale and Quantum of Solace. Skyfall hadn't even come out by the time I was making this video. So, uh, wow, that's quite a statement about Craig. Okay, to give a bit of background as to how this unofficial wonder came about, in the late 1950s, early 1960s, before Harry Saltzman could be broccoli came on the scene, Ian Fleming was working on a planned James Bond movie script along with screenwriter Jack Whittingham and filmmaker Kevin McClory. However, the project fell through, so Fleming used some of the discarded ideas the trio had been throwing around in his next James Bond novel, Thunderball. However, McClory and Whittingham were uncredited for their ideas, and therefore they both sued Fleming, with McClory retaining certain story points and characters from the Thunderball novel, including Ernest Stavro, Blofeld, Spectre, and the plot including the hijacking of atomic bombs. However, by this time the Bond films, produced under Cubby Broccoli and Harry Saltzman, were a big success, and fearing Kevin McClory would produce a rival Bond film with his rights, they agreed to work with a reluctant McClory for the 1965 film Thunderball, which is why McClory is credited as producer on that film. Part of the deal with that film was that McClory could not produce another adaptation of Thunderball for 12 years, so for 12 years the official Bond series could keep on using Spectre and Blofeld. Then in the 1970s, McClory teamed up with Sean Connery and they were going to make their own Bond film, but due to legal issues that never came about. Likewise, though, McClory threatened to sue Cubby Broccoli after learning that Blofeld and Spectre were to be used as villains in The Spy Who Loved Me once this 12-year agreement thing was up. However, now we get to the 1980s and McClory gets gets backing from Warner Brothers to make his own Bond film, but he only has the rights to make one Bond film, Thunderball, a film that's already been made with Sean Connery, who returns again. Yeah. Mm. So with that in mind, we're going to look at the second and so far final unofficial James Bond film, Never Say Never Again. The film opens with the post substitute for a gun barrel sequence in the form of this bizarre 007 silhouette thing, and we see that the film is directed by Irving Kirshner, who did The Empire Strikes Back. Hmm. Anyway, we see Bond on some mission while the main song plays over the titles. Still don't like this song. God. Such a weird theme. But I'm still Good dancing. Good God, this song is absolutely terrible. Oh, yep, hated anyway, it. Anyway, it turns out Bond was actually on a training mission, and we cut to Bond talking to M, who is here played by Edward Fox, who looks far, far too young to be playing M. I mean, I know they make a point of saying he's a new M and that, but God, he's younger than Connery for fuck's sake. Even Robert Brown makes her a better M than this guy. Oh. Uh, anyway, enough ranting. Enough ranting. Now there's going to be more ranting. Uh, that's interesting, because now I think of M's age in that film actually as a bit of a positive. It makes it stand out a little bit. The idea that an M would be younger than Bond is uh, an interesting idea, but not for young Calvin. Have you gotten a sign, Monsieur? Yes. Yes, Moneypenny. 
I'm to eliminate all three radicals. All three radicals. Oh, do be careful. Do be careful. What the fuck? What the hell have they done to Money Penny? Jesus Christ! What happened to the sexy, flirty Money Penny? And why have you replaced her with this, this, this librarian? <laughs> okay, calm. No offense to any librarians out there. Calm, calm. Anyway, Bond is sent to a hell spa to recuperate. Sound uh, familiar to anyone? Uh, meanwhile, we meet one of our main villains and by far the best thing in the film. Barbara Carrera as Fatima Blush. Funny, I would Blush is a member that. of Spectre, and we see her head to a Spectre meeting room to be briefed by Blofeld, played here by Max von Sydow. You will note that we have supplied both rebels and government forces on an equal basis. Well, hang on a minute. That's a Spectre meeting room. No, no, no. This is a Spectre meeting room. That is lazy production design. <laughs> God, I miss Ken Adam. It's here we get our first glimpse of the film's main villain, Maximilian Largo, played here by Klaus Maria Brandauer. That's Largo! That's Largo, really? I mean, I didn't think much of Adolfo Celli, but... Th th that's Largo! It's also here that we learn of Spectre's dastardly plan. The same dastardly plan as the one from Thunderball, except instead of making a double of Domino's brother and killing the real one, they have the real one undergo an eye operation so he can match some retinal pattern thing so he can access some nuclear warheads which are retrieved by Spectre. Anyway, Jack checks into the same hell spa as Bond, with Fatima posing as his nurse, while Bond is seducing Patricia Fearing. Quill's age. Vodka. Foie gras. Foie gras. Foie gras. Not sure Roger Moore would be serving that. Please join me and countless kind people everywhere by never eating foie gras and by telling your friends, your relatives and restaurant owners that foie gras is a disease, not a delicacy. Mm. God, I love you, Roger Moore. Anyway, Bond spies Fatima and Jack, so naturally a Spectre Heavy is sent to dispatch of Bond, in a fight scene which is relatively amusing and well choreographed, but of course, Bond emerges victorious by throwing his urine sample on the assassin. That'll be all the STDs working their magic there. Spectre carry out their dastardly plan and steal the nuclear warheads while Jack Patachi is killed by Fatima once he's done his job. Bond is then recalled in order to go to the Bahamas to investigate, but not before he receives his equipment from Q, played here by Alec McCowan. Now you're on this. I hope we're gonna have some gratuitous sex and violence. Well, you'd never catch Desmond Llewellyn saying that. Bond gets hmm. to the Bahamas and begins flirting with the first woman he sees when his contact there turns up in the form of... Huh? My name is the Bond! Catch you later, perhaps. Right. Nigel Smallfoot, British Embassy, Nassau. How do you do, Nigel? Sorry I'm late. But as you're one of these undercover Johnnies, I took a precaution of not being followed. And that's why you shouted my name across the harbour. Then we're like halfway through this review and barely into the film. It's gonna pick up the pace soon, I assume. Sorry, I'm rather new to all this. Rowan Atkinson! Rowan Atkinson's in this film! Well, fair enough, it's a good job I'm a fan of Rowan Atkinson, isn't it? Otherwise I might find these overt attempts at humour annoying. And take full advantage of the natural cover. <laughs> anyway, Bond does some gallivanting in the Bahamas, meeting up with Fatima and banging her in one of the weirdest sex scenes in the history of cinema before the pair <laughs> go scuba diving and Fatima attaches some shark attracting thing to Bond who must then fight off a load of sharks. Wow, yeah, really, like, genuinely halfway through this, and still, I think, I think What are you doing, Bond? Throw your air tank in the shark's mouth and shoot at it. Everyone knows that's how you get rid of a giant shark. Jaws yeah, reference. Yeah. Right, yep, just show the Jaws clip. <laughs> yeah, the Jaws clip in the spider. Bond, of course, escapes and meets well. up with the woman he was flirting with earlier and bangs her while simultaneously surviving another assassination attempt by Fatima. Rowan Atkinson then tells Bond that Largo is headed to the south of France, so Bond, too, heads to the south of France. It's here that we meet this film's Felix Leiter in the form of Bernie Casey and Bond's other French contact, Nicole, who is this film's Paula. 
in that she doesn't really do anything or add anything to, well, anything. She exists in this film solely to die and therefore motivate the plot. Bond meets Domino, played here by Kim Bassinger, while posing as a hell spa masseuse in a really, really creepy scene. See, Connery of the 1960s could probably get away with this, but, uh... Oh, actually, in fact, he did. He was massaging one of the doctors in Thunderball, and I didn't cringe at that at all. But here... Uh, here I just find myself shuddering. <laughs> uh, he later stalks Domino around a swanky casino where Larko is holding a charity event. The fuck? I mean, I was one until 1989, but was that really the kind of thing they had in high-class casinos around that time? Arcade machines? Largo pops up and challenges Bond to play him at a video game called Domination. We will be fighting for countries chosen at random by the machine. But for this demonstration, I will choose France. Target areas will light up on the map. Whoever hits them first with his laser beam will score points. But there's another way to win. With your left hand, you control two nuclear missiles. With your right hand, you control a shield to block my missiles. But if you fail, boom, I win the game. How long is the, are these clips gonna run for? My god. Okay, I know they just explained how this game works, but I still don't have a fucking clue what's going on. I tell you, you can't beat a good game of battle. Wow, really committed to this scene. <laughs> I tell you, you can't beat a good game of Texas Hold'em. Alright, I guess there's going to be a third one coming up. Well, I'm on the edge of my seat here. Anyway, Bond beats oh. Largo at the game and asks for a dance with Domino. <laughs> Such a weird scene. Uh, good lord. So Connery could write off some dancing lessons against tax. Ladies guess. and gentlemen, the judges scores. So on. Your brother's dead. Keep dancing. Tactful as ever, James. Tactful as ever. Anyway, Bond gets home to see Nicole dead, which is such a shame. I mean, her presence will be sorely missed from this film. I honestly don't know how I'll go on. Oh, but whatever, it gives Bond the motivation to go after Fatima and eventually kill her with his Q branch exploding pen thing. Stuff happens over the next 40 minutes, but nothing yep. particularly good happens. Uh, a real horse is forced to jump off a cliff and land in some water, which sparks off a load of animal cruelty controversy stuff, which means films now have to state that no animals were armed in the making of their pictures. Because animals were sure as hell armed in this film. Bond saves Domino from Largo, and the pair meet with Felix to try and work out where Largo was headed yeah, with right. the bombs. Now, why did Largo anchor here? <laughs> oh, yep. It's dragging this out. I have a feeling there's a really obvious joke to be made here, but. I just can't think what. Bond and Felix head to the phallic location and locate the bombs while Largo tries to escape with Bond following. Right, this is how we got through so much plot in such short oh, space of time. Oh, boring underwater stuff. Over the pair fight minutes. when Domino pops up and kills Largo with her harpoon gun. What a thrilling climax! I think I'm ready to have a heart attack, it was that exciting! <laughs> the film ends with the bombs recovered and Bond and Domino relaxing at some villa when Rowan Atkinson pops up begging Sean Connery to return. Uh, sorry, sorry, I mean begging James Bond to return to duty. Never again. Never? Never, never say never again. Never, never say never again. You're really ending the film like that? Really? 
Yeah, cute, real cute. Oh, fuck off. God, and I thought I hated Thunderball. Good God, never say never again is shit. No, oh, sweary cow. I mean, back. really shit. It's so misguided and hideously dull, with the one glowing exception in the form of Barbara Carrera, who's better than my blush. Who well, I may even prefer Fiona Volpe. The rest of the cast aren't necessarily oh. poor, they're just all hideously miscast. Kim Bassinger is wet and boring as Domino, and whoever thought of casting babyface class Maria Brandauer as Maximilian Largo should be shot. The MI6 shot. regulars are all appallingly done as well. I mean, I can see what the filmmakers are going for, trying to make them different from the official series cast of regulars, but it just doesn't work. It feels really odd. It feels like some kind of alternate dimension bomb. Film. It's, it's just weird. I'm sorry, but I really can't think of any other way to describe this film other than just universally shit. Okay, there are a small handful of things that I like, along with Fatima Blush. I like the tango sequence at the casino, I like the fight sequence at the health clinic, and Rowan Atkinson is amusing as always in the few scenes that he has, but really, that's it. I've tried to judge this film objectively as a standalone film, but even then it's pretty weak. It just doesn't feel right. Connery himself is part of the problem. Besides being too old for the part now, it's like he's trying to emulate Roger Moore in some way by being all smarmy, but it just doesn't work and he comes off as a bit of a git. Never Say Never Again was originally supposed to be released alongside Octopussy, with the press dubbing the situation the Battle of the Bonds, but Never Say Never Again's release date was postponed, and ultimately it didn't make as much money as Octopussy. Hooray! Now Shirley Connery has finally hung up his Walter PPK for good, and he can leave James Bond to someone a bit more younger and for- Oh for fuck jump! Oh for fuck's sake, Connery, just leave Bond alone! Oh. Christ! Anyway, next week we'll be back on the official series with Roger Moore's final 007 Bond film, A View to a Kill. I never get over the pronunciation of Moore. It's my northern accent, which I clearly, uh, yeah. <laughs> clearly, yeah, I, would have had, I must have had some comments about that. All right, yeah, so that was very negative. Yep, Sweary Calvin did make a reappearance. Uh, just brushed over an awful lot of the uh, plot of the film as well. Probably stand by most of that stuff. Like I said at the beginning, I'm slightly surprised that I wasn't uh, tarred and feathered um, for some of the comments that I made on Connery uh, in that one. Like, imagine having the goal to say, leave Bond alone, Connery, my god. Um, I mean, now I, I, I think it's just delightful that we have the From Russia With Love video game with his performance as Bond in that. It's, um, if, in fact, of all of the games, that is the one that I wish would be just preserved for all time because because of his performance in it more than anything else. Um, anyway, you know, I, I thought there were some okay jokes in there. I didn't think it was too awful, too cringy. But as I say, I'm probably just a bit desensitized to this now. <laughs> it's a very clunky edits, uh, but otherwise, you know... It is what it was. Please do let me know your thoughts on the film and indeed this video in the comments section below. Uh, also below you can subscribe to this channel and you can click the Mrs. Bell notification button to stay super up to date on future video uploads. And also below there are links to my various social media pages including my Facebook page, my Twitter page and my Patreon page for those of you who want to go one extra step in supporting this channel. So please do consider uh, doing so and clicking the links to those sites. And with all that being said, and until next time, Bond fans, so long for now.